I'm Richard. It's great to be with you again. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus tells a series of parables all about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew refers to it. The truth about God's kingdom is not knowledge that we can figure out for ourselves. It is revealed to us by God's Holy Spirit, which is why Jesus refers to the secrets of the kingdom. And it all comes down to the rule and reign of God, to the lordship of or or the kingship of Jesus, uh, to everything and everyone being restored into right relationship with God. So that our world might be filled with his love and justice, with his righteousness, peace and joy. God's rule and reign through Jesus makes no sense to us until the spirit reveals it to us. But once he does, we realise that it means everything. So in part one of this series, we looked at the parable of the sower and the four different types of of soil and we became aware of just how much the enemy wants to rob us of this truth about the lordship of Jesus. We were challenged to hold on to this truth and to live in the light of it, to allow nothing to get in the way or to distract us, be that trouble or opposition or the temptations or worries of this life. And then in part two we looked at the parables of the wheat and the weeds and the mustard seed and the yeast. And we were reminded that once we enter into God's kingdom by truly receiving Jesus as our king and committing our whole lives to living under his authority, will he then plants us into our world, into our neighbourhoods and workplaces, amongst our family and friends. And we were reminded of the significance of every decision, however small or insignificant it may seem, to embrace Christ's authority over our lives of the power and potential of God's kingdom in us to bring transformation to the world in which we're planted. And if you missed parts one and two, they're still available on our YouTube channel. But right now, let's crack on with the secrets of the kingdom, part three. And we'll start by reading Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 58. And I'm reading from the NIV translation. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore They sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven, is like the owner of a house who brings out of his store of new treasures as well as old. When Jesus had finished these parables, he moved on from there. And coming to his hometown, he began teaching the people in their synagogue. And they were amazed. Where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers, they asked? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't his mother's name Mary? And aren't his brothers... James, Joseph, Simon and Judas, aren't all his sisters here with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offence at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honour except in his own town and in his own home. And he did not do many miracles there because of their lack of faith. Okay, so this time we have four parables. Treasure hidden in a field, a merchant looking for fine pearls, a net full of fish and the owner of a house with new and old treasures. And then we have some final verses uh, about a prophet without honour. So I'm going to switch up the order a bit uh, and I'm going to start with the parable of the net. 
because there is some similarity here with the parable of the wheat and the weeds that we looked at last time. It's something that we find challenging to think about. The fact that Jesus repeatedly and unashamedly warns us that one day a time of judgment will come. There will be a separation of those who have received God's kingdom and those who have rejected it. But that is ultimately what judgment is about. It's about separation. It's about distinguishing between good and evil, righteousness and unrighteousness, truth and lies, love and hatred, justice and injustice, holy and unholy. And when you think about it, God's judgment is a good thing. Unless we want a world eternally filled with sickness, poverty, crime, injustice and suffering. You see, we rightly resist being judgmental towards those who don't follow Jesus. For the time of judgment has not yet come and we are not the judge. But the time of judgment will one day come for the good of God's creation. And it will ultimately come down to whether we have entered into God's kingdom or not. Whether we've been reconciled with God and brought back into right relationship with him by putting our faith in Jesus Christ and receiving him as our king. Like we said last time, God does not want anyone to miss out on being part of his kingdom, of being part of his new creation, of ruling and reigning with him forever. We're not just trying to live a good life for the sake of it. You've been trusted with the secrets of God's kingdom, with incredibly important and urgent truth that the whole world needs to hear. That's why the kingdom is like treasure hidden in a field or a fine pearl being searched out by a merchant. In both cases, the person looking is prepared to give up anything and everything. If we've truly understood the significance of God's kingdom, it is not something that we can be half-hearted or indifferent about. It's something that we'll be prepared to give everything to be part of. Remember, Jesus said that if we want to follow him, we have to be prepared to leave everything behind and to take up our cross, to die to ourselves, to live only for him and his kingdom. He said the gospel Jesus preached was not a convenient message that would fit in around our lifestyle. It was a radical message that required people to entirely change the direction of their lives. What has following Jesus cost you? What have you had to give up? Because if it hasn't cost you anything, if it isn't currently costing you anything, then I wonder if there are things that God is asking from you that you haven't properly considered. Because it it simply isn't possible to fully enter into God's kingdom without leaving something behind. Now the merchant was intentionally looking for pearls. And I wonder if this links with the owner of the house who brought out the new and old treasures. Because remember that Jesus was talking to a Jewish audience. These were people who'd already had a history with God would already receive many treasures from his word throughout their history with him. It wasn't that God's purpose changed when Jesus came into our world. It was that Jesus fulfilled God's purpose. Jesus made God's purpose possible like never before. So of all the pearls that merchant had ever traded, he'd now found the very best. It was really important for the Jews to understand that Jesus wasn't contradicting God's word to them throughout history. But the teacher of the law who discovers the gospel of Jesus and his kingdom brings out new treasure as well as the old. The truth about Jesus and his kingdom made proper sense of everything that had gone before. Now, I suspect that most of us listening to this message today are not Jewish. We may not have the same historical context and perspective, but this message is nevertheless treasure to us. And once we know what field that treasure is buried in, we will give everything to possess it. Of course, uh, people around us uh, may not realise what treasure lies beneath the surface, and they may look at us and wonder, what on earth are we doing? 
They may wonder why we live the way we do and make the sacrifices that we do and give up the things that we do. They may wonder why on earth we've chosen to follow Jesus to begin with. Maybe they only see what's on the surface, but our prayer is that God might reveal the treasure to them too. Holy Spirit, would you bring revelation to those who can't see? Would you open their eyes? Would you reveal to them the secrets of your kingdom? Would would you reveal the riches and the magnificence of this treasure? Once Jesus had finished telling these parables about the kingdom of God, about the, the wonderful, loving rule and reign of God that is destined to fill and transform our world, He returned to his hometown and he began teaching people in the synagogue. Now, the people there were initially impressed and they were amazed because they recognised that there was something different about his teaching. And I want us to notice the question that they asked. In verse 54, it says that they asked, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Because this message about God's kingdom, of which all of Jesus' life and ministry was based, it was never just about theoretical teachings. It was always about real change and transformation. God's kingdom is not about abstract concept. concept. It's, it's not ultimately about religious ceremonies. God's kingdom is about his authority to rule over everything with his love and justice, with his righteousness, peace and joy. And that's why Jesus constantly healed the sick and cast out demons again and again. He showed that this is about real authority with real power to bring wonderful transformation, to bring healing and freedom. This is a gospel that heals us and sets us free. Paul, one of the early apostles, he would later put it like this in Romans 14, 17. He said, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so he explained in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. The people of of Jesus's hometown became offended when they realised that they knew his human family. See, when we focus on human wisdom and human understanding alone, we miss the true significance of the message that Jesus carried. Because this was a message from heaven, from God himself. This was a message of supernatural origins and supernatural power. And of course, it still is. I believe that God wants to remind us in this season that our preaching of his kingdom must be accompanied by a demonstration of his power. That the kingdom lives we live are spirit anointed lives. That the kingdom of God is not a matter of religious theory, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This life of the kingdom is powerful and it is wonderful. It's a life that we will give anything and everything to enter into. We're going to spend a lot more time as a church talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the coming days. But for now, I do want to finish by taking us back to Acts chapter 1. To the period between Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Acts 1 verses 3 to 8. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
Let's pray together. Father, we want to thank you that you've been speaking to us about these amazing secrets, these truths, these mysteries that you have revealed to us about your glorious, beautiful, wonderful rule and reign. And we long for your kingdom to come. We long for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We long for the transformation of our world. We say, come, Lord Jesus, and establish your kingdom in all of its fullness. Lord God, we want to thank you that you've given us the opportunity to enter in ourselves, to live lives here and now that are ruled by you, King Jesus, and to be part of announcing the beautiful truth of that kingdom to the world around us. So, Lord, we say, yes, we want to give up everything. We might be a part of this kingdom. We want to lay down our lives to be entirely for you and your kingdom, to represent that message, to demonstrate it in our world. And so we say, Lord God, yes, we will wait on you for more of your Holy Spirit. Teach us, Lord, stir that hunger in our hearts, pour out your spirit afresh today and in the coming days, that we would be your Holy Spirit anointed messengers of your kingdom, that we would offer this amazing gospel of your kingdom that is your power unto salvation for those who believe. So have your way in our midst and let your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen. May God bless you. Have an absolutely wonderful week and I look forward to being with you again sometime soon.